You know, it seems to be just a story. Until you think about it, it's concerning a real person, this story of Zacchaeus, which Virginia read so well. But that's the way it always is with Bible stories. You can make them a musty old story that existed back then and really doesn't change anything much. Or you can see that it goes right to the heart of life itself and make it come alive. And to me, this story of Zacchaeus is particularly fascinating because, in a way, it's the story of my life, actually of all of our lives. Jesus passed through Jericho, and there was Zacchaeus, who was a chief among the publicans. He was a community big shot, if you please. He was rich as a result of his tax gathering, but his appetites were not jaded yet, and he still had some curiosity in his life. And since he was short, his curiosity caused him to run ahead and climb a sycamore tree so that he could see Jesus. Now use your imagination to make these stories come alive. Here is Jesus walking along and a crowd surging around him, all of the sights and sounds and smells of an oriental city. And some people trying to get closer to him than others and a little elbowing and all of them rushing to try to be as close as they could. Some of them trying to get his attention to talk to him and in the middle of all of this, he looked up into the sycamore tree with all of its leaves and somehow knew Zacchaeus was there and these are not the exact words, but he said, hello Zacchaeus. Hurry up and get down out of that tree because I'm going to eat lunch at your house today. Now my mind works in strange ways and I've often thought, what if Zacchaeus had said, who do you think you are, Buster, inviting yourself to lunch at my house? I didn't invite you. What do you mean you're going to eat at my house and stay a while today? Hey, man, forget it. But he did. He got excited. And he received this invitation joyfully, and down out of the tree he came. Maybe a part of his acceptance was still curiosity. And he came down out of the tree, and uh, Jesus then went with, his, with him to his home. And then Jesus became a, a part of his life permanently, not just for one afternoon. And you know it was a genuine conversion when he talks about putting things right with his money. Now that's usually the last thing that gets put right when a person is converted. Look, he said, I'm going to give half of all that I have to the poor, and if I've cheated anyone, I'm going to make it right with him. Uh, anybody I may have overtaxed or cheated, I'm going to make it right. But the key sentences in this story are these. Jesus said this day, is salvation come to your house? For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And when I read this, there are several other passages of Scripture that jump to mind, but particularly two of them. Earlier in Luke, we would have read about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost boy. Lost things are tragic. We want them back. We hate to think about losing them, whatever they may be. I have been so thrilled that the news last night reported they found this eight-year-old boy over in the mountains between Carolina and Tennessee who's been missing for eight days. And he's alive, and he's going to be all right. And our hearts take a leap with this kind of thing. Uh, nothing will stir up a city sidewalk or a or a countryside worse or quicker than some little boy lost in the city or some little girl lost in the hills. It will mobilize an entire community. There's potential for tragedy and lost money. And I remember that King David lost the sense of God in his life, and one of the most agonized and beautiful prayers ever prayed was this 51st Psalm where a key verse is, O oh God, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. 
Get back in my life, God, and get me on the right track again. Uh, there's potential for tragedy and lost money. Now, I never did see money in all my life as important enough to jump out a window for, as some people did in the 29. Uh, people keep saying to me, if we could just get back to normal, and I'm not sure what normal is. In the 1940s, people said, if we could just get back to normal. <clears throat> I remember the Great Depression. And if it was normal then, things are five times better now than they were then. I can remember putting cardboard in the soles of my shoes to go to school because we couldn't afford to resole them and thinking nothing of it. I remember the bread lines and the hungry people. And I remember this guy who'd been making $600 a month as an executive of an oil company and he lost that, and I remember his crying with joy because he got a $15 a week job. I know we've got some people hurting today, and I don't want us to forget that. And we pray that things will be better for all of us. But normal? What is normal? What do we want to go back to if we say we want to go back to normal? I'd rather go ahead to a higher norm. <clears throat> but we talk about life in terms of things. Poor people, rich people, ignorant people, cultured people. God doesn't think about people that way. Not at all. Those are things we relate to for ourselves and our own advantage and our own growth. Culture is an admirable thing, but God doesn't think about us in that way. He wants us to be all that we can be, but he doesn't judge us in that way. And he reaches us in the strangest places and strangest situations. Anybody who expects God just to speak to them in the sanctuary is already, in a sense, lost him. You took this story of the richest man in town being up in a tree. If you went out this morning to look for the richest man in town, would you look for him up in a tree? But that's where Jesus found him. Years ago, the Lord found a man sitting on a curb in Chicago center fielder for the Chicago White Sox. And he spoke to him and changed his life, and Billy Sunday became a better Christian and preacher than he was a center fielder and turned the world upside down for God. God found an unusual person in a strange place. And as a matter of fact, if you want to know it, he can find anyone, anywhere, if you're willing for him to. Now, there are four ideas in this passage that I want to suggest to you, and they're wrapped around four words. <clears throat> First of these is curiosity. When Jesus said something about, except you receive him as a little child, included in that is the idea of the wonder that children have. It doesn't say Zacchaeus went looking for Jesus to become a Christian. He was looking for him out of curiosity. He wanted to see what he looked like, and he knew he was short enough that he couldn't see him just standing down in the crowd. He was curious about him. I heard about a man in Missouri who wondered how many teeth a mule had, and he put his fingers in the mule's mouth. The mule wanted to know how many fingers a man had, and they both had their curiosity satisfied. Sometimes having your curiosity satisfied is a disappointment. I had a radio program, The Word and Music, for a time in Oklahoma City where you'd make a few comments and play a record, make a few comments and play a record, sort of a religious disc jockey. And this lady came to church one Sunday, and afterwards she said, I must say that you're personally a disappointment. Your sermon was good, but she said, I pictured you as gray-haired, dignified, handsome, and with a mustache. <laughs> well, I ignored a couple of those things, but I told her, lady, someday I'm going to have gray hair, I know, if I make it that far, but I've had a mustache, mustache once, and I'm not going to have that again. But Zacchaeus was not disappointed. He was so excited that the second word jumps at us out of the Scripture. He got so excited when his curiosity was satisfied that he got a compulsion, a compulsion to do something about this thing that had come into his life. Curiosity got him in the top of that tree, but then that curiosity grabbed him. And that's the eternal must. 
in the scriptures. Paul said, I must do these things. I can't do anything else. I am compelled. I am urged. I am forced. I want you to know this morning that I turned my back on a top personnel job to be a minister. But it wasn't a sacrifice because there wasn't anything in that job except working with people and some money. And those are not the important things to me because I, if I may say it this way, there was an eternal knocking at the door of my life and I just couldn't turn it down. I just couldn't say no. And Christ called Zacchaeus to come down. People ask me once in a while, does God still call people to preach? You might as well ask, did God ever call anybody to preach? Just ask that question. Or well, the implication seems to be, did these preachers just take it up as an easy life? Some people think a preacher just works a couple of hours a week. On Sunday, he gets up and the word flows out. God puts the words in his mouth. I discovered that when I count on God to do it for me, he usually is over at the Baptist church that Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, did the preacher just take it up as an easy way of life? Well, I can assure you now that if you did, you weren't going very far before you were disillusioned. I was a great deal younger then and a lot more foolish, and I wouldn't do it now, but I had a man in one of my first churches who kept telling me this, and he was serious, you know. What do you do? Well, you can't really explain it because it's made up of so many things, and part of the allure of the job is that it's so unexpected. You don't know what the next thing's going to be. Uh, but anyway, my wife was going to be gone for a week to visit her folks in Tulsa, and so very stupidly I invited this fellow to just come and go with me everywhere, live at the Parsonage and go with me everywhere. And he stayed two days, and he didn't have to have the stress of preparing a sermon. When I did counseling, he just sat out there and knew I was doing counseling. He didn't have the pressure of that making decisions and preparing talks and so on and so forth. But after two days, he went home saying that if nothing else, the telephone calls morning, noon, and in the middle of the night disturbed him enough that he gave up. Now, I must admit that three of those emergency calls, come right now, preacher, we've really got a problem in the middle of the night, was a little unusual. I'm not going far enough to say that the Lord sent those calls because I don't believe God slapped somebody next to us to, to wake us up. But what I'm saying about preaching is similar to what I told a young man a while back about getting married. If you can live without her, you better not. But if you can't live without her, you'd better get married. Preaching, if you feel the eternal must that God wants you to do this, you better do it. You'll never be happy anywhere else. If God wants you to be a real estate agent, you better do it. If he wants you to be an insurance man, you'd better do it and do it as a Christian and do it his way. If you feel the eternal must, that's what you'd better do. I spoke one time in New Jersey and a man wrote offering me a very, very lucrative job. But I had too much joy serving the Lord and so... I didn't even answer it, and that was rude, but he called me long distance and he said, aren't you interested? And I said, no. You see, what I'm doing has too much power and too much allure for me, and I don't have any desire to change. If I may say it awkwardly in this way, I was already allured to something. I was already drawn to something, compelled to something, and that happened to Zacchaeus. His curiosity got him into the presence of Jesus, and that gave him a compelling force in his life, which led to the third word. He was converted. Converto, to turn and go with. He said, Lord, I'm going to give more than half of all I have to put things right. Now, there's nothing in the Bible that requires that you give half or all. Jesus said that to the rich young ruler because that was the dominating force in his life. But that wasn't a commandment to all of us. 
Barnabas gave all he had because he felt led to do it. But nothing requires that except in the sense that everything we have is his and had better be rightly used. But parenthetically, I'll say to you this morning, there are some things in the scriptures that point a finger right straight at you if you don't return a tenth to plant as your seed faith. It always gets quiet, real quiet, when the preacher says the tithe is the Lord's. But that's there just as surely and as strongly as God so loved the world. Not a legal requirement. It's a symbol. And I didn't make it up, but it's there. Zacchaeus wanted everything right, so he said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make me honest again, to get me back in relationship with anybody I may have cheated or mistreated. Now you may be saying, well, this doesn't touch me, preacher. I've never cheated anyone. That's great. If you can really honestly say that, I think that's tremendous power to you. I would just say, be sure you aren't keeping some of God's seed money because he expects you to plant that back into his work as college men young men often wear one another's clothing and I understand that young women also do this I once met an older man who had borrowed for an evening a diamond stick pin of one of his dormitory roommates and the dormitory roommate thought it had been stolen reported it, and things got pretty sticky for a while. And uh, I asked him why, since he hadn't meant to steal it, he just picked it up to use it for an evening. He couldn't just put it back on the table and not say anything. And he said, well, I got stubborn. I got so riled by the whole thing that I just kept it. I'm not sure how much that was being riled, but Nevertheless, that's what he said. It made me think of the daddy who said to his little boy, Son, I put two $1 bills in this drawer yesterday, and you and I are the only ones who knew about it. Now, what about that? And the little boy thought a minute, and he said, Daddy, let's just both of us put $1 apiece back and put say no more about it. <laughs> He'd hung on to it all these years. This fellow said to me, I've often thought about the rich young ruler and Jesus telling him one thing thou lackest. He said, you know, that one thing has barred me from peace of mind and peace of soul all these years because I never put it right. Never got it back right. But Zacchaeus wanted everything. When he was converted, he wanted everything restored. Restore unto me, or give me, God, the joy of my salvation. And when he did, his conversion became consecrated. Jesus said, this day is salvation come to your house. What a great thing to know. I hope you know that this morning. I hope you feel it. Because if you really feel it, it will change your life. It'll change anybody's life as it changed Zacchaeus. When I was a little boy growing up, they used to have pictures in all of the little churches. I haven't seen one in 30 years, but they used to have pictures in all of the little churches about a, a mountainous region, and here was a path that ran along the mountainous region, and down in a crevice alongside the path was a poor little sheep bleeding, you could almost hear it, bleeding pitifully. And down the side of the crevice comes the shepherd with his robe and his crook and clinging to a piece of rock and inching along to reach that sheep. And you knew he was going to save that sheep and got it back up on, get it back up on the path, back into life and back into reality. Now you know where this verse comes from. There in Matthew, the 18th chapter, Jesus is depicted as the good shepherd. But if 90 and 9 have gone into the fold and the shepherd has put his hands on their backs and counted them and he knows he's one short, then that one's as important as the 90 and 9 that are in the fold and he goes out looking for him. 
And God looks for us in the same way. It is not his will that any person be lost. There is a judgment in God's relationship to us, but it's not one that he forces. It one, it's one that happens when we force him and refuse him. And there's a song we used to sing in church, and I'm sorry it isn't in our hymnal anymore, but you're going to sing it at the end of this service. There were ninety and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the fold, but one was out on the hills, far away, far off from the gates of gold. And the story and the song go on to tell about the shepherd seeking and finding the stray. And then when he did, there arose a glad cry in the gates of heaven, not just around the fold, but in the gates of heaven, rejoice, I have found my sheep. And the angels echoed around the throne, rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. Do you feel rejoicing in that? I do. I talk about Somebody finding God who's not had him or who's wandered away from him, and I can feel it right there. I can feel it right there. It's something I can't even put into words to know that here is a life that eternally is going to be right and in relationship with God because they've turned and sought him and found him and he's been looking for them all the time. Thank God. Thank God. Jesus cares enough to look for us when we're lost. And nobody, nobody is unimportant to him. Everybody is as important as everyone else. And this morning, I hope that you're saying, Oh God, create in me a clean heart. Restore or deepen the joy of thy salvation. For he already seeks you, wants you, desires you. And when you respond to him, this day, this day, has salvation come to your house like Zacchaeus. Rejoice! Rejoice! For the Lord brings back his own. Amen.